You know, in the, in, in the office here, we see a lot of chronic neck problems. Why do you think chronic neck problems are getting, like, so rampant? A lot of it has to do with being on the computer, uh, with poor posture, you know, as we kind of slunk over, we're over our phones, um, you know, over books, uh, things like that, that have increased definitely, you know, um, in, you know, in the last decade or so in cell phones, everyone's got one and, and so forth. You wrote an amazing paper actually describing this, how capsular ligament injuries are really why people have chronic neck pain. So how does bending forward or texting, how does that injure the ligaments? Well, there's actually two ways that the, inter, uh, the ligaments could be injured for the most part. One is a really big force in a small amount of time, as if you're rear-ended, you get in a car accident, um, get whiplash or so forth. And the other is a small force over a long period of time. So every time you're hunched over your phone, playing a game or texting or hunched over the computer, all of the ligaments in your neck, they're under a really small force, but eight hours a day, five to six days a week, over time, that could actually equal you know, the same as being in a car accident or getting that, that huge force um, to get the same amount of injury. And in the paper, you called that joint instability or right. cervical instability. Right. What kind of symptoms? does cervical instability cause? It can cause a, a myriad. Um, a lot of people will get a lot of clicking or popping in the neck or feel the need to kind of adjust their neck um, or make it crack all the time. A lot of muscle tightness, maybe in the traps or you know, kind of at the base of the neck or even at the base of the skull, um, depending on the area. Patients get a lot of chronic neck pain, maybe even some neck stiffness, um, loss of range of motion. If the instability is more prevalent around C1, C2, or the top of the neck, uh, there's a whole other even subset of symptoms that patients could get, like migraine headaches, again, tightness in that area, ringing in the ears, dizziness, vertigo, drop attacks. Um, these are just, just to name a few. Um, sometimes the symptoms are more dependent on the area as well. You know, a lot of people, before they see you or me or Dr. Special, they... Uh, often get a lot of different diagnoses. What are some of the diagnoses that they may have had where really the problem is cervical instability? Sure, sure. So a lot of patients will get, um, you know, a diagnosis of maybe osteoarthritis, um, maybe even a pinched nerve um, or radiculopathy. Some people are even diagnosed with things like trigeminal neuralgia or occipital neuralgia, um, you know, pinching of the nerves in that area. Um, oftentimes, patients, the, the muscle spasms that come with cervical instability are so painful that they get a lot of muscle spasm, myofascial pain um, diagnoses as well, when really it, it's all related to that underlying soft tissue. Uh, diagnoses that's common in the, that you hear a lot on radio and television and magazines is post-concussion syndrome. Sure. It, could post-concussion syndrome also be from cervical instability? Absolutely. You know, if you think about when you get a concussion, whether you're kicked in the head or tackled or you're in a, you know, a bad accident, um, you know, everyone's main focus is the brain, you know, because as part of, um, you know, after that injury, which is, which is valid, you know. But what happens is that people that have a concussion and then they heal really well and scans, you know, months and months later are all coming back normal for the brain while they still have all these symptoms, you know, there's something missing. And what it, it, what it is is that when you hit your head or you get a, a, an injury severe enough to get a concussion, your neck actually gets that same force. You know, if you hit um, maybe the steering wheel in your car or whatnot, your neck is still getting all of those forces as well. So even though brain scans are normal, you know, months after a concussion, but patients are still getting dizziness or their brain feels foggy or memory problems, you know, a lot of it could be, you know, undiagnosed problems in the neck. So how would you go about trying to objectively determine somebody has instability in their Sure. Neck? So there's actually, um, you know, standard MRI, standard x-rays where the patient is laying down often don't give us a, a good example of really what's going on. And oftentimes patients that have post-concussion syndrome, um, whiplash, you know, dysfunction, laying down is their best position. So when they get these x-rays or they get these MRIs and they're laying down, they may not give us... Um, the best picture because that doesn't that's not what reproduces symptoms um, other imaging maybe like uh, flexion extension um, MRIs or upright MRIs or even a digital motion x-ray where you're actually getting an x-ray movie of the patient as they move their head and let's say you know every time they look over their shoulder that's when they get symptoms we can actually see what's happening with the bones um, during one of those exams so if you did a digital motion x-ray on somebody which we now have that capability in one of sure. our offices of 
the what would you actually see? Like, what do you see on those? Scans? What you'll actually see. So X-rays show bone. You know, they don't really show soft tissue, but you can look to see how the bones are moving. So if every time that person, you know, maybe looks over their shoulder, if there's extra moving or extra sliding of the vertebrae, you can conclude that that soft tissue that's supposed to help hold them together is not strong enough to do its job. That's why you get the extra movement. Or, you know, every time they tilt their head, maybe, you know, their upper cervical vertebrae are sliding a little bit more. You can conclude that, okay, that soft tissue that's there that's supposed to help hold that together is now loose. It's, it's unstable. And then how does uh, instability relate to like degenerative disc disease? Because a lot of patients come in and they have cervical degenerative disc disease. Sure. And we've even seen patients that that's what their MRI says, so they get surgery on their disc and then they're no better, you know, than they were before. And what happens is these capsular ligaments that we talked about that are supposed to help stabilize the, the spine, when they're injured, what happens is that extra motion in that vertebrae is what kind of wears down the disc. So it's not that your disc gen degeneration just happens for no reason and then you get the instability. The instability is what happens first. And then over time, with that extra motion of these vertebrae, you know, that little motion is going to degenerate that disc more and more as time goes on. A new operation that more and more people are getting recommended is like disc replacement. So really what you're saying is the disc may be bad, but you actually do have to address the reason that the disc... Right, you can replace the disc, but if you don't get that soft tissue taken care of and, and strengthened, you know, that it's not going to be successful long term. And then some people do get diagnosed with cervical instability and then they go to a surgeon, then they get a fusion. Mm -hmm. Why would you say maybe they should try prolotherapy instead of fusion? Well, the, the surgeon's goal with fusion is to get, you know, the area fused so it's stable. And that's our goal too. We want the, the joints to be stable as well, but without putting in hardware or doing neck surgeries and actually getting at the root cause, you know, that's what prolotherapy does, is we're gonna work to strengthen those ligaments, gain that stability in the neck without, you know, operations. Especially too with fusion, if you fuse an area, you know, you might fuse one level or two levels, oftentimes it's more comprehensive than that. You know, there's injury kind of all throughout the neck. And so when you fuse areas, that area doesn't move anymore. It, it, it's, it's, it's done. So the motion has to come from somewhere else. And oftentimes the motion comes from above or below the area. And then patients end up with even more instability or degeneration in those areas um, and then and, and more pain. You know, and instead of going back for more fusions and so forth, um, we've actually seen them come to our office instead, you know, when fusions have failed.